Okay, Trans this is the, uh, what are we, October 18th Transportation Advisory Committee meeting, and I'll call roll John Anderson. Here. 16th. Jonathan David. Here. Scott Fe uh, Felmusker. Here. Blaine Meyer. Here. Eddie Shafsma. Here. Steve Johnson. Here. Bob LaSalle. Here. Fred Wallace. Here. Robert Mahoney. Here. <clears throat> so, I don't know if you need to approve the minutes or if you want to go right into this or how do you want to, which do you want to do first? Yes, has everyone had a chance to read the minutes and, uh, okay. And uh, so, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I move the minutes be approved. Yes. Right. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right. uh, any discussion? All right, then uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Okay. So, um, you remember, we've dedicated today's meeting to um, transportation system plan and a discussion of that. And uh, if, if you haven't met Carl, he's here to give us a rundown of, of what we've done to date and has a few slides from past presentations. Gail Curtis <coughs> is also in the audience. Um, some of you know her from the open houses and the other meetings that we've had, you've attended. Um, she's the project manager for for ODOT, and um, you're also, you've got a long history of planning with ODOT. I do. I've been there for some 14 years. Mm. And um, I've also, if there's questions that should come up about the ODOT um, facilities, I'm happy to answer those. Likely Carl knows the answers well. <laughs> or perhaps better. So Carl Springs with DKS, and they're the they're um, one of a handful of regional planning, uh, transportation planning firms, consultants, and uh, doing a great job. So, and he's got some show and tell stuff. So we'll just let you take over. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, welcome. Glad to see you all. Some of you are familiar faces from other committees, and this shouldn't be news. Uh, for you all, but the rest of you, you can chime in. Or if you've been saving up your questions for tonight and you want to really want to dig into something like John over here may want to dig into something, mm -hmm. uh, then we'll go that route. So what I have, I assume you all have this stuff on your screen, right? Uh, so I've got a few slides there and then I've got, uh, we broke out the project list that was in technical memo 11 into bigger, gnarlier lists that show scores and cost estimates at special requests. And we can go over that at the appropriate time. I think these are the things we wanted to cover tonight, so just a little bit about the TSP process and where we are. I think mo most of what our time tonight is to talk about the projects we've identified and kind of a little bit of how the scoring process went, which is a <coughs> kind of a quantitative way that we decide how well the projects match up to the values of the community, uh, basically. And uh, then talk a little bit about the outcomes as they sit to date and a few other details. You guys might find, you guys and one woman, might, have, might find of interest in discussing. So this is uh, the flow of a transportation system plan update. You start with kind of looking at the regulatory framework, uh, the policies and plans you have in place either within the city or within the, the joining jurisdictions. You take a snapshot of the way things are working today and you see what works and doesn't work and then you stretch out to the year 2035, which is what we call the horizon year for this plan update. And we figure out what doesn't work then, uh, what we can do about funding between now and then, so we kind of kind of get our arms around how much money is in the in the pot, and then we start looking at solutions, and we come up with a long list of solutions, far more than your funding can cover, 
Uh, the idea being to, f to try to address some of those system deficiencies that are either evident today or will be evident in the future. And then we get to the point where we figure out how to adopt it and what changes are needed to the city code to m make these uh, decisions that we've come up with through the process actually fall into place at the time of development review and those kinds of things. And uh, we'll have adoption hearings. We're planning on starting those uh, beginning of next year. I think it's February of next year is when that starts. So some of the, just a little bit of background. There's basically eight goals guiding this process, and they're listed here, and I'm not going to read them for you. But those are what we use to derive the, the scoring process. We basically, for each goal here, we devise a thing called an evaluation criteria. So it's a way of. Uh, providing a, a quantitative way of assessing how well we work towards those goals for individual projects. Um, and for that, we go through, a, and this is just an example of a case for goal number two. So you've got basically three criteria for that goal, uh, whether it improves, makes no change, or reduces connectivity and accessibility for pedestrian and bike facilities same kind of question about transit and uh, provision of other kinds of services so sir mr D mr Donovan. As part of the goals one thing that i don't see that i think is very important for especially alternative modes is a safety component you're just doing convenience and accessibility and and number three is safety yeah oh okay well when i was looking at that last slide you had before that yeah that's where safety shows up as under under number three and that that's true for any kind of mode it's not just okay. pets or bikes but it's any kind of mode <coughs> Um, does, you're right. Does, does that include signing? Safety includes signing uh, along with the traffic uh, plan? Well, signing, you mean like traffic signing? Yeah, and left turns and, and right turns. Can, that can be part of the solution. I mean, the goal, the goal though, is saying we're trying to keep the community safe. And mm -hmm. where there's cases where there's evidence that shows it hasn't been safe or it's performing below what you'd want, then one of the measures to correct that might be traffic science. It could be other things. So when you say safe, are you talking about actual collisions? or That's really the best evidence we have is where you have reported crashes. Uh, the other information we get is from uh, this, when the community, um, you know, attends one of the community open houses or they post something on the website that the city uh, developed. That's information that we can get, you know, for the near misses, the stuff that people say, you know, I really don't like this intersection for these reasons. You know, we can look at those and see what we can and can't do about it. Uh, so, yeah, some of it is actual material evidence where it's a reported crash to the DMV and we have all that statistics. And some of it is just people's opinions weighing on in places where there may not really be a lot of reported crashes because people have learned to avoid it. That kind of a thing. Great so, question, Carl. Yes, John. In the packets that were sent out, we have a list of these in priority order. Would you be showing that in the... I wasn't planning on it. Okay, so I had a question about the priority order. Maybe this goes to the policy here. Now, I think these eight were put in a priority order. So, for example, the first one is enhanced health and safety of the residents, which Jonathan was referring to. Right. And um, so if we wanted to <laughs> question the order, that they're in, um, or if one of the future policy, like planning commission or city council, wanted to question the order, I'll give you an example. What what would be the process? So, for example, um, ensure the transportation system supports prosperous and competitive economy. So, if creating jobs and having more industrial development, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is a high priority with say the city council right now of the eight it's number seven now whether it's in position number seven or position number three or four i don't know if that makes much difference in how things get rated out does that put a uh, you're questioning how sensitive that ordering is yeah that's your question is? yeah so would it move uh let's just say a, a roundabout in an industrial area ahead of a roundabout in a residential area uh, yeah, I guess in that comparison, the <laughs> industrial one would score a little bit better. All other things being equal. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, we have, that's all, all this, all this analysis is done 
basically on a spreadsheet they'll be turning over to the city and so if they want to change the priorities they can they can right. certainly do that and again for those who aren't a member of that other committee the reason these things <coughs> got uh, they weren't uh, we, we began this with saying all goals are equal and then there was some feedback that says well maybe some of these goals are more important than others and so we put out a survey and uh, committee members responded to them and we basically took that information and we said okay here's the new order and I think you're right number three on this list floated up to number one uh, the safe uh, yeah the health and safety on the, on the handout that you have or you were sent it's on page two uh, it lists the Eight goals, or bullets there. Yeah, the first and priority Health and safety right. is number one. It is, yeah. It is right. I think, you know, in terms of public acceptance of this and the rationale, seeing safety number one, mm -hmm. I think that fits people's logic. Right. So it's good to have it number one, but that one may be easy to peg that way. So some of the others may or may not be an ideal order. That's why I was asking the question, what might happen down the road? Well, you certainly, the city, you know, the bottom line, this is a decision-making tool. Right. And the, the city is free to tailor it, however their, their policies change over the years if new decision-makers come into power. And, you know, they're all about uh, prosperity and economic development, then you could do it another way. But again, you're just... You know, this isn't a numbers-driven, strictly process. Uh, we are we providing you numbers, but certainly staff. There's other there's other information that comes into the process about selecting exactly which projects can be advanced for construction. Right? I mean, there's there's all kinds of obstacles, constraint to getting funding, and those aren't necessarily reflected in the scoring process. And some are much more attractive than others for those reasons that may not be apparent in the scoring process. So. It's kind of our best attempt, assuming all things are neutral like that, mm -hmm. of kind of pushing what's more important to the community based on the goals that we understand they have. And so, but there's certainly flexibility to change that as need be in the end. Thanks. And you are educating us on how, how the process works. So I was curious along those lines. You sent out a survey, but who was that that was surveyed? Um, Let's see, uh, do I remember? I know it was all the... We sent it to the TAC, we sent it to the... Yes. Um, so we sent it to this group, mm -hmm. we sent it to... We've also got a technical advisory work group, or technical advisory group, and a stakeholder advisory group. Yeah, those three groups. I know those three groups got it. There may have been others. Uh, one of the problems, I mean, the suggestion came out of, out of one of those work groups, I don't remember which, that we should you know, try to put these in a, in a little more order. Same and I, order. I, I remember um, Carl having a little bit of resistance to that, but yet, you know, we've been trying to do, you know, as much community, especially if it's, uh, if it's, it's got some merit to it, you know, and that one did have some discussion. So we put together, I know Carl put together the, the survey and sent it out. I would say it was um, maybe based on those groups, it was pretty good response but based on the overall uh, you know because I think we posted it to the website as well so um, um, maybe not maybe I don't remember that don't remember the idea was to try to get that um, get you know more input there and I, I don't remember there being an overwhelming amount of input on that but uh, but what I also remember about this is that there's very little difference between what's listed as number one and what's listed as number eight there's not a lot of yeah, as far as the scoring in, into the scoring on this particular item. So would it be possible to just eliminate the numbers? The weighting. Oh, then the, well, the you can use bullets, eight. I guess, instead of numbers. I would yeah. Say. Yeah. Well, it might be worthwhile before you go to the city commission okay. that you put it in the order, which is on this document or this page, which states listed in order of importance to the community. Right. And get that. On to this okay. presentation. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> I had one other question. Um, just out of curiosity, again, uh, the terms equitable, balanced, and connected, multimodal. I get connected. Um, 
equitable and balanced. How do, how do they define that? I mean, is that, you know, 177 million for uh, automobile and 50 million for the bicycles and ped. I'm not sure what they mean, but I mean, you know, by equitable and balanced. Well, let's see. I have to think about the what was the, the intent was on the balance. The equitable on the way we normally is applied is, a, is that anybody in the community has an equal shot to the system, shot at the system, mm -hmm. assuming they all have bikes and can ride a bike sure. or have legs and can walk. Uh, you know that they uh, any part of the community actually has similar access to those kinds of facilities, so you're not favoring one piece of the community yeah. and not another. I mean, that's kind of what the equity piece is yeah. about. Uh, the balanced one, I'd have to think about a little bit. That particular word, I'm not quite sure where I go with that. It seems very similar to me in terms of here, you know, you're, you're balancing those projects as well across the community. But well, I think, yeah, I think it's more along the lines of having, uh, you know, uh, lots of different kinds of travel choices in the community. I think that's more along the lines of what it is because. You need to recognize, I mean, uh, and, and you all know this stuff, but the, the general population thinks about transportation planning like in very simplistic terms, like what, does, what should the system look like during the commute hour? Well, the, the, that's part of the question, but the other part of the question is that at 11 o'clock in the morning when there's a, you know, a, a, a family and the, the, one, the one spouse has the car and they're at work, the other spouse has no car and wants to go somewhere, so what do they do then at 11 o'clock in the morning? Do they walk? Do they take a bike? Do they hop on, try to find a bus? So you have to kind of, you know, we as planners have to think about kind of what's going on all hours of the day and not just the commute and how busy things are, the commute kind of a thing. So, so you're balancing solutions to demand and that kind of just trying solutions to Solutions to demand, well, certainly we're doing that. That's a piece of it. But, mm -hmm. but also, like I said, giving people options. Um, because not every, you know, people, not everybody has access to a car at all times of the day, and that's just not, a, that's not their only choice. Could funding be, or could balance be tied to funding and saying we're going to fund other modes and, and uh, not just be heavy-handed on auto-driven projects and that we're going to ensure that in our TSP that we're funding the alternate modes? Yeah, well, the city has got a record of funding other modes. I think. I mean, I think you'll find there's a later slide here that'll show you how the <laughs> proportions are ch changing with this plan. You're, pu you're putting more money into the non-motorized travel modes, basically, than you have in the past, uh, which is a common a common trend, and is partly an outcome of uh, the way these goals lined up, and just just the sense of not just Oregon City, but a lot of the metro area is looking for solutions other than newer, bigger roads uh, for all the reasons we just talked about. The traveling public is going to look at this in terms of how much does it cost me to get from point A to point B. Right. And one of them is the price of gas. You know, they're going to change from one mode to the X. Uh, we've gone from one car to two, or from two cars to one because of the cost of travel. So I look at this as a sliding scale. I think of the planning commission or city council looking at a multi-acre, huge commercial or mixed-use zone change, and with uh, implications of traffic involved, uh, multi uh, uh, transportation, trimet, light rail, that kind of stuff, and it, it could happen. Who knows? Right. And they're going to have to look at all of this, and they're all words, and they're all subject <laughs> to interpretation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have to merge those with how much money do we have to spend on a solution to the problem. So it's, to, to me, this is, uh, is, if you can get it as flexible as you can, because some way down, uh, down the road, five, ten years, there's going to be a different power structure in this city looking at different problems. And uh, so, you know, if you write this in, in cement and... Uh, and then uh, scale it to numbers. Mm -hmm. You put yourself in a corner that somebody's going to call you on it, and you're mm -hmm. not going to have an answer. So, but if it's flexible, and if it's a sliding scale, then the elected and appointed officials have got different approaches that they can that they can apply, especially when there's money involved. Right. You know. 
One last question on, on this, uh, for me anyway. Um, number five, sustainable. How do they define, what does that mean? Uh, the, well, the, the <clears throat> unfortunately that is a word has, that has been used in a lot of different contexts lately. Uh, the way it gets used in transportation of, oftentimes is kind of twofold. It's one is, you know, minimize environmental impacts and minimize uh, use of uh, non-renewable energy. That's those are the two pieces of it. You know, so you're looking for uh, both the environment and other other options than just you know oil fuel vehicles. Um, those are the two pieces. But I've I've seen sustainability used for a whole kind you know financial reasons. Yeah, that's what I think of. You know, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we've really applied it that way here, because mm -hmm. you know we've we've just made it. You know, if you're familiar with the TSP, we've made assumptions that the way you get money and the way you collect money for transportation will basically continue into the future. We haven't made radical assumptions about a new fee program or the price of gas doubling or anything like that. Um, so we haven't taken that step. All right, um, so underneath each of those eight goals, whatever order they may be, are there's a separate tech memo, and if you haven't jumped into it, it's, uh, it's online under the, the city's website. It basically breaks out what all the criteria are uh, and shows you that. And I'll, when I hand out this project list, you'll see some of the weights of the scoring for each of the projects. Um, so basically we did the scoring by basically compete within their own classes so we've got you know the driving solutions the walking solutions the biking solutions and several other categories and so the scoring applies to those projects within those categories and they compete so a, a walking project doesn't compete with a driving project that would be that would be hard to compare I, I guess what brought me to my first question is it'd be nice to and I don't know how it's weighted in other areas but I see a safety improvement for a biker ped project uh -huh. should be able to be weighted as a positive or somehow. So if it's a bike ped oh. project and it improves safety, well, is, that, is, is that captured in the other in the other goal? Sure, because when you score a project, you score across okay. all goals. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, uh, what we found when we did the scoring just behind the scenes is because we there's so many goals covering so much territory and some of them overlap sort of. You know, some of these things we were debating here about the, the impact of the weighting, it really is pretty muted when because there's so many numbers involved in this process. Uh, it, you know, the, the weighting, the ordering of the goals really was kind of muted, and it didn't, didn't move the projects around a lot when we basically took the slider and said, well, okay, this goal is more important than that goal. It just things didn't jump around a lot, so... Um, that's part of the reason is, is for each goal we have several criteria and depending on how they perform, you know, I mean, some clearly have benefits, and some clearly have negative, but a lot of them kind of are in the middle. They do a little bit of good or a little bit of bad, and they're just kind of stuck in the middle. So, um, anyway, I don't know, does that yeah. answer your question? This, this, uh, <coughs> the process of, of voting was something that, that DKS did for us, right? They, they, they used this system, which was something that I think was vetted in the, in the groups, and then, right. and then, uh, maybe you or Kevin DKS looked at each project. Right. Each and went project through this long, daunting process, right? Yeah. So for the eight goals, they have several. Each each, each um, goal has several criteria. This one actually has three, and so I think in total there was you know twenty five or thirty different criteria that you scored for each projects out of the several hundred projects. Uh, and so what you un end up with when you come out of that is you have a cumulative score for each project. And then we rank, we sorted that and then we said, well, where's the cut line? You know, what, what, which portion of that list are we going to try to find and which portion are just going to be on the list but not likely to be funded? And I've, I don't know what, at what point we want to get into it, but I've got... Actually, this isn't. This is a carryover from one of our earlier ones. But I've got handouts that show you. Um, now you've got the tech memo that shows the index maps and the tables, right? Well, these are the same index numbers, so they want one of each of these. 
that those are stapled and these are singles, but they need basically two pieces of paper. So I'm hand, or John's handing out uh, the. This is the same project, so they're just in a revised format. So we broke out the categories. So the single sheet are all the driving solution projects, and the stapled sheet are all the other categories stapled together. So if you remember the the key there, D is for driving, mm -hmm. W for walking, B is for biking, C. You're not gonna have one. Uh, I yeah. guess I should have, well, I might have if you have extras. <coughs> I took, it didn't, we, we guessed low on I know. how many there's going to be. <laughs> Carl, yeah, yeah. unfortunately we used gray shading. That was yeah. unfortunate. But just, just off the top of your head <laughs> yeah. and with a snap of your fingers, how many man hours are involved in doing that? In involved in identifying and projects and projecting costs. Well, I mean, there, there was done in done in stages. I mean, the first the first piece was identifying uh, the potential solutions, and so we do that based on uh, deficiencies in the system that we see today or deficiencies that we expect tomorrow. So we that's how we develop the long list, and then we go back later and score them, and come up with a cost estimate. So yeah, if you put that all together, it's it's several days worth of work. Is it based on pro uh, population projections as well? What you well, the population piece comes in the travel forecast. So we have information about how the city is expected to grow by the year 2035, where the population growth will be, where the job growth will be in the city, and then our forecasts include uh, growth outside the city as well. So, you know, when you've got, uh, on, at least on the state facilities, you've got a fair amount of through traffic on pretty much all of them, I think. Uh, so it reflects whatever growth is going on in Canby or in Gladstone or, you know, even in up, uh, other points of the metro area. That's all reflected in our forecast. So that's where the population piece comes in is in the travel forecast. Okay. So it is a long, it's a long process, and frankly, it's, it's, it's different than we used to do in the good old days, you know, when we just have project lists. You know, we, we it's, it's a fra fairly new evolution where we actually go through and do a scoring process like this because in recent years we've been asked, well, we, the communities have been asked to come up with effectively a financially constrained plan and some people don't like that phrase, but it basically says you've got a plan that you think you can reasonably afford to build given the growth that you're planning on. And that's what this process kind of moves you in that direction to doing is helps you identify out of that long list of projects, which I think in total is about $200 million, uh, what share of that can you likely fund? That's question number one. And then, uh, then which of those $200 million is going to slide into that range that you can likely fund? So it's, a, it's an interesting process, and um, that, so what we're describing kind of works toward that. Maybe change the name to reasonable fund, funded plan. <laughs> funded yeah, plan. we should just say funded and dream plan. Right? <laughs> I don't know what. That's, but that's the real world. <laughs> I don't know what the other option would be. Um, but before, I mean, wasn't there like a, a list and maybe there was some community vetting of that? But in, in the end, it was kind of the consultants and maybe staff kind of prioritizing. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I think it was. I think it was just a lot more kind of opinion based uh, and not quite as much analysis based. Uh, and and in the good old days, well, good old days, the old days. We'll take the good out. The uh, bad old days. The decisions were much more driven toward um, the motor vehicle side, mainly because you had the analytical tools to support it, and you really didn't have the equivalent set of tools for the pet and bike modes. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about performance or what benefits there are, that methods and science really wasn't there and it's still really not there, although it's catching up a lot quicker uh, than it was a few years ago. Um, so uh, I think, I'm, yeah, here's the next slide. So this is an interesting little slide because it breaks out those categories that are on your sheet. So on the left half is how they broke out uh, in the in the current TSP you have the one that was done in 2001 so this is a numerically can't speaking half the projects were driving 20% uh, or so were bike and 30% or so were walking and then 
over on the right side is the way the list stands right now. You've got about a quarter of them are driving, and they split out walking, biking. Then this, these three new categories that we introduced, the shared use path, the family friendly, and crossing, I think crossing is important because, you know, for years we were designing sidewalk, we're planning on building sidewalks where there was gaps or important gaps. They were talking about bike lanes or some, or some kind of bike facility, but we really didn't focus in on how you get across that facility and how what the spacing should be. And this time we spent special interest on that uh, for safety reasons, for access to transit reasons and those kinds of things. And so... We've kind of grouped them into a new category called crossings, and that's what that's. It's really on arterials only. I mean, you really don't need that kind of a thing on the lower, slower speed streets. You don't need that kind of a treatment. Pedestrian crossings, right? It's pedestrian crossings, yes. Yes, but a lot of times you see bikes use those signals to get across. Right, but it's yeah, it's not. It's not driving crossings. It's, it's no, better no. Better it's better it's better. it's usually mid block or or inter, un, you know where wherever you don't have a signal right where you can't push a button and get a light. And you want to try to cross and it's busy or the speeds are too high or whatever reason. It's it's some kind of improvement to help that. So if you're talking about a safe connected community, you know it's got to go beyond that arterial that that kids don't like to cross or even some adults don't like to cross. Or what is in the definition of family friendly? Family friendly is a category of projects we identify through this process. Um, they're basically a connection, uh, a system, and I don't, sorry, I don't have that map. You might have it in your packet. Uh, it's basically, for the most part, it's existing a low volume, low speed, mostly local streets where you're trying to provide supplemental signing or routing or that kind of thing. It's not so much, uh, you know, it's not going to do widening improvements or add, you know, bike lanes necessarily, but you're trying to give um, segments of the community uh, routes that they can take to stay off the busier, faster streets. Like bike boulevard. Kind of like, you know, the bike boulevard idea. Um, and there are, there could be some cost. It's pretty loosely defined in the TSP at this point. There's kind of more like a toolkit of solutions. We're not saying you're going to go in there and, you know, build bike lanes or construct sidewalks because I, you know, frankly, on lower volume, low speed streets, you really don't need that. I mean, you can have the bikes right in the auto lane and they're just, they're fine because the chances of them seeing a car are pretty small uh, in those kind of situations. It's the higher speed, higher volume arterials where you really got to pay attention. I always think of them as uh, streets that have yeah, they're the green um, features that might uh, be, again, not specific to bikes, or but they, but you feel more comfortable on them. So, like uh, the little speed circles you see in in uh, some neighborhoods, that they just they're designed to slow the traffic down. Maybe there's right. a less on-street parking so that it's, the sight distances are a little better. You just as a pedestrian or a biker feel safe being there, safer being there. So that's what I think is the most family friendly streets. Right. The only thing I don't have is a good, what, what's a good example? Probably? Yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to get some photos because I'm sure this will come up again. You know, we'll have to. Would speed humps be part of that? It could. I'm a little leery of, well, I mean, speed humps are the whole family of tra what, what, what are described as traffic calming solutions, uh, you know, speed humps and traffic circles and other kinds of things, curb extensions, those are all kind of classified as traffic calming. And traffic calming is a polite way of saying, drive your car slower, would you, buddy? Uh, and, and kind of a physical way of saying that. Uh, what I've, My history with those is that, you know, what, what's best for the community is to kind of have some guidelines of how to implement that or, or what the cases are for implement that. But it really kind of should be driven, at least initially, by the neighborhood that you're talking about doing it. Because some there's a pretty mixed review on those things. And if you went to a neighborhood and said, yeah, we're going to put in three speed temps along here, uh, some would like it and some would hate it. And so you have to be a little cautious about charging out and do that. First you have to identify the need and it's, it's pretty much by uh, what you hear from the neighborhood, good, bad, and ugly. And many of the descriptions of the family-friendly family projects 
it states add wayfinding, traffic calming, and shared lane markings. So in the traffic calming <coughs> part of it, that would be more than just markings in some cases. It could right? be. It could be. I mean, Newton, what I think of as traffic calming are speed humps. I don't know what the latest the latest nomenclature it keeps changing. That's unfortunately. It used to be once upon a time it was speed bumps, and then it was pavement undulations, which is more like what. And then it was, now I think the latest is speed humps, although I've heard them called speed cushions, which is, <laughs> I think, maybe my favorite phrase. But basically, basically it's about three inches of asphalt <laughs> with a long curvature. It's about 30 feet long, and it just a little whoop in the road as you go over it, 20, 25. Um, you guys have also witnessed them, I guess, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think I think it'd be helpful if the uh, well. I, oh, okay. I guess my comments earlier was traffic calming in general. Uh, you have to be kind of selective about whether you do that. But so we've identified uh, routes that, that could be. And if you have it, you know, uh, uh, Gail was kind enough to bring this up here. So if you have these diagrams where the projects are, so Figure Six, for example, do you have those in your packets? Or no, you do. Okay. I think the last one. Yeah. I think it is the last one, yeah. So the family friendly routes are those bright green lines. Let's have a quick comment. I I applaud the the direction this is going. I just have a problem with the term family friendly. When I think family friendly, I think of five four or five year olds. Women uh -huh. with carriages. Hmm. That's yeah. the first thing that pops in. Family friendly. Oh, I got a young child. I can take my kid there. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know if I put my four year old in the street. Fair enough. Fair enough. I but can if put him on a multi use path for sure. Yeah, yeah. But when I think family friendly, I think that's the whole family. That's the woman with the baby carriage. That's the woman with the toddler, the young kids, that, and the projects that I've heard described so far, I wouldn't put that age demographic on that facility. How about neighborhood friendly? Neighborhood friendly, maybe. We struggled this, a bit with a name. We should have had a naming you. contest on that. There you go. <laughs> I think originally it was like neighborhood greenways, and we're like, yeah, no, we're not going to have. John good. Then John was thinking he was going to put in planter strips and landscape. And we're like, no, no, not necessarily. Or neighborhood undulations. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. If I was, you know, a young mother, oh, it's family friendly. I can take my kid there and I get there. And, well, so, so I, I don't know. Is, is this one in which there's sidewalk where everything's green or not necessarily? What was that comment about sidewalks? So we're at family friendly. We're getting the green line. Right. It doesn't assume that in all cases you're building sidewalk. I think I said that's what you're asking. Yeah, I was going to say, okay, so we are not sidewalks. It is not always the green. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> not necessarily. Okay. Sorry, I'm it's not distracted. You didn't put the green where there was sidewalk. Uh, we didn't put the green where there was sidewalk. That's, right. that's a question. That's true. Not always. Not always. Ninth, Ninth Street is on your notes. Some have sidewalks and some not. We're, we're not uniformly saying wherever there's a green line, there's going to be sidewalks okay. on both sides of the street, or that 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 wedge would be a lot bigger. Okay. The sidewalks, love them or hate them, they're kind of expensive, especially when you're talking about a few miles of sidewalk there. So the, there's a good example kind of in the middle. Does everybody know where uh, Chapin Park is in Boynton Reservoir? There's a street mm -hmm. called Boynton over there. Um, and that's one of the ones that's shown as planned family friendly. So right now there's curb and gutter and there's on-street parking and there's no sidewalks. And I would say that would be one of those areas where we probably wouldn't suggest sidewalks, but we might want to put Cheros, for instance, and we might want to, as you enter those neighborhoods off of Warner Parrot, have uh, maybe a stronger signage that would kind of let people know. There might be uh, uh, neighborhood signage in, a, in addition to kind of like, I don't like to put those slow kids signs, but you know what I mean? More, <laughs> of, a, more of a neighborhood indicator that you're in a different place than, mm -hmm. than you were when you were out on Warner Parrot. Um, Maybe there's a curb extension in there, um, you know. So it's it's those kinds of things that aren't going to cost uh, high dollars to put in, but right. they're going to send a message to most people, 
and it would be a street, John, where I would say the mother and her stroller, maybe bringing along the four-year-old, could walk along and not feel like they were Go threatened home. by the well, fact that they, you know, obviously if they see a car coming, they better grab a hold of that four-year-old and say, you know, come over to the side of the street. But it's different than, say, putting them on Warner Parrot, which has got, you know, higher traffic, big bike lanes, there's, you know, there's limited parking on one side, it's still not a place where I put a four-year-old because that four-year-old could, you know, dash right off the bat. So, that's, that's what they do. But the other thing I might mention, Boynton is a cut-through street from, from Central Point to Warner Parrot. It is. You yeah. know, I know there's one stop sign at Highland. But, you know, and also a lot of cars on that road when there's games at Chip and Park. So I always think of that one as, you know, is there an opportunity for a, a little circle, you know, kind of like you do at the intersection right. where the stop signs get blown through, but the circles kind of... Slow people down, yeah. because it is a busy park mm -hmm. with games. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And bike riding, you know, kids do ride their bike even out of my neighborhood there. Yeah. Yeah, the mothers with their strollers and young children are out there. The question is, they're go they're on some street somewhere in the city, right? We're just trying to maybe give them an option they might feel more comfortable. It's not going to be ideal, uh, but you know they're out there now doing something. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to work on the naming convention. You can put that. Maybe that can be the website next week's I contest for the uh, website. I don't I know. Didn't find it. Are we okay? Got a question? I would say, John, Jonathan, uh, um, I remember that topic being discussed at one of the groups. Maybe you remember, Gail, it was either the the technical group or, or maybe both. But that whole family-friendly thing, it did come out, and there was consensus on. I think they generally liked it. They certainly liked it better than Neighborhood Greenway, which yeah. evokes different kinds of ideas. Like you're going to go build something that's green, and it's really well, not. I remember really that, not that, that meant. Greenway was not. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a Portland term, and mm. it, it didn't translate well down here, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. Is there anywhere where we can find uh, the 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 original definition of exactly what that me family friend means? It seems a little vague in my mind. Yeah. Well, there's other. Um, it should be. I'm trying to find the tech memo. I was just flipping through it. We don't have a table of contents yet in our. Tech memos, but I printed all the recent ones uh, just yesterday, Carl. I, I guess the reason I was thinking about that is we're going to get a multi-use path. I think of that as family friendly. Right. And then uh, it definitely is. It's definitely more so than what we're talking about here. But we're we're, we're just recognizing the fact that. Given the constraints you got, I mean, there are really very few places where you can oh, suggest a new multi-use path, and so we're trying to give you know it's people in the neighborhood a reasonable option. That's okay. basically the idea. I just had an issue with family, the terminology. Fair enough, That's fair enough. <laughs> well, I got that. More That's and more people are uh, getting caught up in this walking uh, uh, uh -huh. program. Are we talking about walkers? Is that what we're mm -hmm. talking about? Certainly could be walkers. Walking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's essentially what they're doing, walking their dog, walking yeah. their kids, or just jogging or walking themselves. Right. Well, it seems to be a little bit, in my mind, different. It almost becomes maybe not a slush fund, I mean, or a catch-all um, but, you know, carving out 9%, I mean, you have the traditional walking, bike, and, and auto. Uh, and now I, I, I get the crossing, that, that part I get. Yeah. But the, fam, the family friendly is kind of like, hmm. And I guess that could be applied in a lot of different ways depending on the need. So that's Yeah, we do have it more defined. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't think John is over there digging. But it's in one of the earlier tech memos. There's, a, there's picture examples, and there's a little bit more definition about what that is. Um, so oh, sorry about that. I mean, I think part of it is part of the important piece of it. I think is a little bit of the improvements, and it's partly the awareness uh, for the potential users, whether they're on foot or on bike or on in a car, that this is a place that you're going to have to figure out how to share mm -hmm. the space better than just any old neighborhood street. Uh, so it, to me, it's more of a, an awareness thing, and that'll be mostly be done through mm -hmm. signage and that kind of a thing, as opposed to a, a physical improvement on the street, because those are. It cost a lot. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Like yeah that. most of the descriptions say add wayfinding and shared lane markings. Right. And some relatively inexpensive kinds of ways and 
Okay. It'll be a little bit of an educational process for the community once you start doing those kinds of things. And frankly, it'll be done incrementally over time. You know, you'll start in one neighborhood and kind of work your way and applaud your own success. No, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we, the last diagram was kind of the breakout and the numeric, how they break up by categories. And this diagram reminds you that that streets are expensive, and so even though they represent roughly a quarter numerically of the projects, they account for three quarters of the dollars. Um, and so that's the way the rest of it works out in terms of dollars go. You got about a quarter for everything else from a cost standpoint. That's interesting. Yeah, streets are expensive. Well, yeah. that's, I think that's. For lots of reasons. Um, Let me just ask a question here. Um, yes, sir. Those of you on the transportation committee, does that seem like a logical or reasonable split, 75-25 roughly? Okay. In terms of how the city's recommending the money be spent, or the plan, the plan would recommend the money be spent. Right. That's where the plan sits right now. It's about... Three, right, like I said, three quarters, one quarter, and this is I don't I didn't have this slide with us. We had it at the last uh, open house, but uh, I think the current plan it's instead of being one quarter, three quarters, it's about nine tenths, one tenth. Mm -hmm. And I think one tenth is for other modes, and nine tenths is for streets. Mm -hmm. It's it's much smaller portion for non auto. So. Well, it would seem that allocation would, would go primarily to to meet demand, and demand is clearly, you know, in the, in the automobile, on the streets, and access, and, and so forth. You know, as as time goes on, and there's greater demand for for you know bike and ped lanes and other you know those kinds of things, then then I'll. You might see that shift. Am I wrong in that? I mean, is that you're talking about people getting out of their cars and walking more? Is that what you're saying? Walking more, mm -hmm. but I don't. You know, it doesn't seem like that's at this point. It's more recreational than say, can, can, you know, bicycle commuting or. I, that could well be. I, 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 again, I would, I would argue that each are legitimate. You know, if somebody wants to go to a neighbor's house to talk, they should have a, a reasonable way to get there without hopping in their car and driving. Six blocks. I mean, I, I mean, I, like I said, we we tend to put more emphasis on the commute piece, um, but I think we have the, the the city has all kinds of travel patterns and travel needs and things that happen all kinds of time of the day, uh, and so I think that's what this is trying to recognize. And mm -hmm. and you're not we're not the science. Like I said, the science isn't there yet on being able to forecast demand for walking and biking. It hasn't caught up to the auto side. Uh, I wouldn't think it'd be very long. I think the next time the city does their TSP, they'll probably be there. They'll probably be able to predict that a lot better than they do now. Um, so it's, it's partly demand-driven. It's partly, um, you know, the way we go through and do the, the system uh, gaps and deficiencies analysis is partly just structurally the way the city's laid out, the, given the terrain and the, and the um, topography. and what kind of uh, geographic constraints you have. We look for spacing patterns. We look for kind of a grid system for not only streets, but other kinds of facilities. And so partly the, the ones that are on that list, the non-car list, are trying to fill those gaps in areas that seem to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, not, it's more driven by system design than it is by us being able to tell you there's going to be a hundred bicyclists on a particular route, which okay. maybe someday we'll be able to do. I have a question for John. In the auto side where the share is going to be 25%, is there a way of incorporating the maintenance and preservation of projects and tying them into the newer projects so that you can do them all at once and there's no redundancy so that you have the crew out there and you might be doing the ends for maintenance and preservation doing something in the middle so that we can save some dollars? Is there any type of plan that we can implement and, and have a good idea of where the maintenance and preservation dollars are going to go and tie that in with the projects that are identified? 
Well, I think we I think we do that to some extent now. I think our having that five year plan is going to be very helpful because it's going to give us you know another document to show what we're planning and when we're planning to do it, and marry that up with a project that might be um, uh, um, SDC eligible. And so yeah, I I, I mean <coughs> my hope is to use the <coughs> The uh, five-year pavement plan with our water master plan with our transportation system plan and develop a five-year plan that a five-year uh, uh, capital improvement plan that kind of shows where it's funded and how they're going to marry up I, I mean it's not a per it's not gonna be very it's not gonna be a perfect world because none of those are going to match up but at least have that you know goal to kind of include efficiencies there wherever it makes sense so I think that's we've got the best tools that we've ever had in these long range plans. I mean they really they really do help us out a lot. John, did you did you have any um, ideas about the seventy five twenty five split and, and No, I, I thought it was pretty good. In fact when we showed the earlier slide that showed uh, yeah, when you look at that slide it looks like driving is only twenty seven percent. But that's the number of projects, that's not the, the dollar value. That's right. right. And so the count. having the second slide, that slide, that increased my comfort level. So I understood <laughs> what was going on. Okay. Yeah, you can do lots of little inexpensive projects on those other slices. Uh, yeah, that's just the reality of it. Fun stuff. I love being a planner. Um, so. <laughs> That's the last slide I had on the project piece. Did you guys kind of satiate yourself on questions? Uh, John will always have more, I think. He <laughs> seems to be relentless. Keep going, John. You're okay. <laughs> yes. I noticed that a walking project number 50 didn't have any project description. Well... W fifty, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I think it's I think it's two pieces. Well, this says Parish Road sidewalk infill. So I think forty nine and fifty are the same thing, but then there's just two different segments to it. So South End Road to Eastern Terminus and Kohler Drive to Central Point Road, and that's why it's oh I see okay. showing the way it is because there's several of them like that. If you go yeah, up to I, I, I found several of them like that. I don't know why I didn't pick up on that one. Well, yeah, they're just they're just segments on along the same stretch of road, basically. Because that's the way we do the cost estimates for that kind of thing. It's just strictly based on length. And then all the crossings are are eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, there we got amazing. a we got a volume discount. No, it's, <laughs> it's just it's a target number. Some are going to be more. Some are going to be less. But it's a reasonable average. You know, there's lots of things you can do for. Pedestrian crossings for eighty thousand dollars. That gives you a lot of flexibility, frankly. Uh, so, okay, here's a pop question. I, you can't answer this one, Jonathan. So, I, if you if you had a brand new traffic signal, you say you had an intersection that had curb gutter sidewalks on all four corners, and you decided you wanted to go build a brand new traffic signal, how much do you think that would cost? Three hundred thousand. Okay. How, anybody else? I mean, like red. Red light. Yeah, the red, yellow, green lights, the mast arms, yeah. the signal heads, all the detectors mm. in the street, the computer that runs it, all that kind of stuff. What would you guess? 20. 28,000? 260. What listen, year? You're 1970. listening to him. <laughs> <laughs> you put, in 1970, you could put one in for $65,000. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the quarter million is a good guess at this point. You're amazing. It's, it's amazing. You don't see you don't you don't think it's that much. A lot of it's underground, uh, and those those mast arms and the signal heads those those things are expensive. Look how long it's taken to move that one up by Beaver Creek Road. Mm. It took all it's, summer. It's a big deal. Right, they, Carl, how does lane. how does that compare to a traffic circle, and how do traffic it. engineers <laughs> decide the traffic circle is more effective than the traffic yeah. light? Well, uh, John, are you describing a roundabout or a circle? Right. Cause a roundabout. A 
around. The circles are the ones that fit within standard intersections. They're a little mm -hmm. tiny. They're like 15 feet across. Yeah. Yeah. The roundabout is the real deal, where yeah. you can actually drive around it at a reasonable speed, and trucks can actually make it without going one wheel over the middle. And that roundabout. Yeah, roundabouts, they can be quite a bit more. The The thing is, when you do the life cycle costs of a roundabout, is quite a bit less than a signal, uh, because you're not paying for electricity, and you're not paying for text to, uh, to fine-tune the signal timing, uh, and to keep the detectors live, and replace the signal heads, and all that stuff. It really adds up. Over time, I'm not saying that it's a one-for-one -one swap. I mean, in not all cases is around about the right solution, but there are cases where it is. And I think over time, we've, the evidence is pretty clear that it's it's a good choice. It's actually generally, uh, from a safety point of view, it's generally a you know, if you had an intersection that it was it was equally suitable for a signal around about, you probably want to go with a roundabout for cost and for safety because vehicles go through it slower, and so the severity and the frequency of the crashes actually goes way down compared to a signal. Nobody flies through a roundabout at 45 miles an hour, or there'll be other problems they're going to have to deal with, which is... And also pedestrian crossings have shorter, are shorter. They're, yeah, shorter crossing length for pedestrians, that kind of thing. Uh, it can be a little bit of a learning curve for, for bicyclists going through a roundabout. They, sometimes they're not quite sure where they're supposed to be, uh, depending on which one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's an interesting option. Um, look at and I, and I know the city's been looking at it at a few places including on division right John does the cost of a roundabout or your estimated costs is that strictly for the construction or does that include an estimate of purchasing the adjacent properties I, I think some it, of those are in residential pretty much residential areas and they might touch four different properties yeah uh, some of them have actually, some of the locations where we've identified roundabouts, we actually did kind of a sketch level analysis of what the right of way requirement would be. And so we've, we've identified that. In other cases, we have just general average costs that we apply. You know, the, the, the size of a roundabout can vary quite a bit. You know, right. this, the, some of the bigger ones are, you know, 200 feet across. And you're going to be a little bit picky about where you put that because uh, it takes up a lot of land, but if you have a high truck volume, you kind of need the bigger ones. Jug uh, handle. I'm sorry? The jug handle. Uh, yeah, the jug handle, and you know, any place you've got uh, a, a fair number of trucks, they're going to ask for a larger radius mm -hmm. curve than what you would normally apply. I mean, even though they can make it through it, they'll, they will not be happy about going through the, the smaller radius ones. The city of Portland put some circles in, and you couldn't get you couldn't make a left turn. On a yeah, th those are traffic yeah. circles. Yeah, they used to they put those on certain neighborhoods to, to keep through traffic basically out. They took of them that out. Is what they did. They took them back out. Some, they? Well, I used to live back in the fifties. I lived on this on Cooch Street. Okay. In you know in the northeast side up towards Warhurst. Right. And they had a couple in there, and I come in with my pickup, and I couldn't make a left turn without backing up and going on the wrong side of the road. The left oh. side of the, just oh. make a left turn. That's not good. Because I couldn't make a right turn. I left turn around it because it was just... Yeah, we're not recommending any of those in this plan as far as I know. We didn't slip any of those in on you. I don't think John would be that excited about that. Mm -hmm. or maybe with the who knows. Um, all right, so that, uh, the next piece I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because we've talked about it with other committees, and you're, you're the Transportation Advisory Committee. You should want to say something about the mobility targets. Was that a phrase you're familiar with? What's a mobility target? The volume to capacity ratio, level of service, all that kind of stuff. You've probably seen a number of traffic studies that talk about that, what's good, bad, and ugly. Um, so the city's current standard for signal controlled intersections is a level, what's described here on the diagram is level of service D. Uh, and what uh, a lot of other agencies are moving towards is a allows for basically more congestion during the peak hours of the day. And so there's a numeric uh, indication there, uh, slightly less than one. So you're basically operating at capacity, essentially near capacity at the, during the peak hour. Similar kind of comparison on the right side of the diagram there for unsignalized intersections. You've got an E and you're basically going back up to one. Um, in case you didn't know this, I'll the unsignalized intersection, that rating, a level of service seat, that isn't for all traffic that uses the intersection. That's only the poor guys on the side street trying to turn on to the big the highway. Uh, 
So whereas the signalized intersection, that's an indication of average delay for all traffic that uses the intersection. So one of the discussions we've been having through the TSP update is does the city hold their current mobility targets, the ones that are shown there in the brownish color, the mobile service D and E, or are they going to allow a bit more congestion during the peak hour uh, than they have been doing historically? So, um, Who makes that decision? Would the city makes that decision? The city makes that decision? It's the city standards. It's in your development code, mm -hmm. and so it's a city decision for okay. sure. So it requires an ordinance change? It requires an ordinance change, and the, and the development code will have to follow through. So anytime you know development comes in for review and they have a conforming use, they're going to have to meet whatever that standard is uh, in terms of uh, mobility goes. I mean, there's lots of other standards they have to meet, but that's the one of them that they they're going to have to meet. So the question is, do you alter what you've got, or do you go to a different one? The the motivation for going for a different one is you'll be in sync with. Uh, where ODOT is, and they're thinking about long-range planning, nice ringtone, uh, and then uh, you'd also be in sync with what Metro is thinking in terms of their long-range planning, because frankly, what they realized, I mean, this is not, it's not a difficult thing to explain, frankly, because they realize they can't afford to expand the system to serve lesser congestion. They don't have the funding wherewithal to make it happen, and so they've, they've moved their congestion levels to allow um, more congestion during the busy hours of the day to reflect that. And so part, part of the decision in this process needs to be what, what does the city choose to do in that. And the, the one thing I'll mention is if the city holds their current standard and, and they, um, uh, they will be less competitive for regional funding for transportation facilities because basically what this, this metro would argue would be that you're oversizing your facilities compared to their targets. So they don't want to help pay for it. So mm. <laughs> is it too simplistic to give us a comparison? So looking at the current peak hour at a LOS uh, level of service at D, uh -huh. is, does that mean, I'm, I'm just picking a number here, you wait three minutes to get through the traffic signal at the intersection and the new one in gray you wait five minutes. I mean, is there some way that Those numbers aren't right, but yeah, you'll be waiting longer for sure. I mean, it's, you can, it's not, it's you not can that long. You can quantify it. Huh? You can quantify it, yeah. There's, there's a average vehicle delay per vehicle. There's average delay per vehicle for when you have signalized intersections. Mm -hmm. And so, how much is that spread in lay terms? Are you averaging? the delay and then the average delay increase. Yeah, I used to be better on that number. It's, it's, I can't remember exactly. I'm thinking the average for a D range is about uh, 40 or 50 seconds. And for the range that we're talking here, that's more like 60 or 70 seconds. So it's, it's a pretty, proportionally, it's a pretty significant jump. Yeah, so people will notice it. Well, heck yeah, they notice it. Okay, so so then you're just saying build fewer traffic lanes and have more congestion. That's the trade-off that the policymakers need to look at. Right, right. And again, the congestion happens for a few hours of the day, and the rest of the day it works right. dandy, which is what the next slide talks about. Um, these are data in... Oregon City where you can so you've probably seen these kinds of curves before where so the orange line is the volume of traffic across the hours of the day and so on 2nd Street and on Beaver Creek Road you can see that it gets to its peak for about one hour in the morning and about two hours in the afternoon and the rest of the day it's pretty sharply below those levels uh, especially midday it's it's probably 30 percent less uh, or at least on the one side anyway. And so when you're talking about a, a differential about, um, you know, peak capacity, just pick a number, let's say it's 20% difference between the level of service D and that, uh, that numeric value that I said. So in cases where, um, you know, the volume is, l is that much less here, it would work fine, right? So 
the point here that, that I wanted to present to you is that um, 20 hours a day, uh, even if you had that congestion during the peak hour, it would work fine. Three or four hours a day, you'd have congestion. And, and that's really the way I look at it is what's going on all day and not just during the busiest hours of the day, which has been the traditional model for doing these kinds of things. Is this in one of the memos, this chart? Not that particular chart, because uh, we wanted to have a little bit of facts to kind of inform the discussion. Yeah. So I think that is an excellent chart to help lay people understand mm -hmm. what the choices are. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can certainly incorporate that kind of information. Um, in a bigger picture, it comes down to, um, you know, at a system level, you'll find that there's, there's probably a handful of locations that are really going to be up in the, the high congestion, long delay category on city facilities. You're going to have plenty on the state facilities that are in that level, but not there's really not a long list of city facilities, streets, or intersections that work poorly during the peak hours. It's mostly state, right? Am I, am I wrong on that? Is there a lot of... Well, Central Point to Warner Parrot to Lynn that were the five. Well, that yeah, you need a roundabout there. What are you talking about? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean you know, and then you know it's like an emergency route. It says ninety nine, you know e, uh -huh. you know, and people turn you know off Warner Parrot across you know the lanes into the Cookie Mark. Yeah, sure. Yeah. People do crazy things to yeah. avoid the lanes. But you're right. Primarily, it's you know McLaughlin. Right. And and so, so their their policy, the people that own and operate their those facilities, have made the decision to have this other threshold, the point nine nine. So that's what they're that's what they're aiming for. In fact, in some cases, they're not quite getting there. The, the demand will be greater than that, and they, because of constraints, you know, because you've got ninety nine running along the whole river, there's not a lot, uh, any expectation that they're going to expand that to serve the higher demand. They're, it's going to be the way it's going to be. Uh, and so, um, you know, the th as a city, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if you've got regional facilities where the congestion really is and they're shooting for that higher target, is it, wor is it worth your investment in the city facility to have, to have less congestion during those few hours of the day when you know that's just going to quicken the trip down to the regional facilities where the congestion really is? I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of the, the way I would look at it. At least for the kind of trips where you're getting on the state system. I kind of got a quick question. I, I really like going to VC ratios over LOS. Yeah. But maybe not having them so high because if they were a little bit lower, it's easier to measure and then say you're exceeding the threshold and you need to mitigate right. this because of development. Right. So if it wasn't so high, it's easier to say to the developer, you're exceeding this. Right. And you need to mitigate it. Right. <clears throat> But if it's so high on a local system, and he comes in, and he wants to develop. He's not going to. He doesn't quite meet that threshold. He's not going to have to mitigate for that. And I don't think that's a great idea. That's a fair point. One thing, um, I, one thing I was wondering, Carl, um, and this may apply to some of our signalized intersections, but the unsignalized intersections. So, from. The way I kind of see it is uh, signalized intersections, if um, there's delays and frustrations with that delay, it's still pretty unlikely that you're going to see, you know, you're not going to see too many people running that, you're not, you know, you're not going to see no. people yelling at one another. But if you're at an unsignalized intersection, let's say a four-way stop, and you've got, um, you know, you've got capacity problems at that. You often see people struggling with those. You know, if 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 you got four lanes coming into a four-way stop, and they're all several cars stacked up, you know, that you got you find people trying to figure out, you know, who's going to let who go first. They're waving one another on. Before you know it, you know, some people are trying to be friendly, other people are. Angry. So, I, I guess what I'm getting to is, it seems to me like we should have a higher standard at the unsignalized intersections because. I'm not sure that they're high accident areas, but they're they're those kind of things that are going to be most likely to anger people, most likely to have confrontations, most likely to be kind of fender bender situations. And so, 
I'm thinking it seems like we should have a higher standard for our unsignalized intersections. The other piece about that is they're less likely to be impacted by the state system. It, at least in my mind, I'm thinking they are because they're going to be maybe a little further deeper into the city than something that's close to 99 mm. E or 213. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, like the intersection of Main and 14th is a hopping little intersection. Well, that, that's, that's, that is an unsignalized intersection. Yeah, but that's not the norm. That intersection <laughs> is <laughs> atypical <laughs> and unfortunate. My dad but, a signal on there to pick. And John, uh, I, think, I think your comment ties into my sorry, previous comment that if you so tighten the standard, both yeah. signalized yeah. and unsignalized, yeah. if development came in and were to occur yes. and they were to exceed that, they would be forced to mitigate it. So they'd have to pay for the fixes. True. That's that. Yeah, that's. And true. that's what we want. We want development, but we also want development to pay for itself and to pay for the problems that it creates in the system. So the bees, these would be offsite improvements somewhere in the system that there's congestion. Somewhere, somehow, it could be at the intersection. It could be. I, I don't know what the solution is. It depends on what the issue was, but that would put the onus on the developer. Mm. Right. If we made it. You know, lowered was VC ratios. Is there another possible uh, scenario in which, if, if we target lower congestion and the state on their system goes for higher congestion, over time, people frustrated with the congestion on 213, say at Beaver Creek or whatever, they're going to get over on Holly and stuff like that. So they'll start. <coughs> It may start a migration towards city streets, so that may be good or bad. But um, that's true. I don't see a good side of that. Is there a good side of that? I oh, maybe there is. But For businesses. Health <laughs> 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 businesses on all. Yeah. Well, the other thing <laughs> is, is um, so signal. I'm just looking at our arterials um, and wondering, would it be unusual to have uh, that? to match the ODOT standard on our arterials because they're definitely linked to the ODOT system. And, I mean, if you talk about the development piece, um, a lot of our development's infill and, you know, if, if we don't meet the volume to capacity ratio there, that's a, you know, that's going to be a deal killer for that development, right, for, in most cases. But on our other streets, Again, trying to feel, you know, get a higher standard on those. I'm, is it is it appropriate to have variable standards? I guess that's where I'm kind of wondering because it seems to me like our arterials are going to be kind of hard pressed because of the ODOT thing. So we pretty much, I've always <laughs> felt like we pretty much need to match, you know, their standard for signalized intersections. And now kind of hearing this again for about the fourth time, I'm kind of wondering, well, what about some of those other locations? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I've seen, I've seen stratified standards. Um, the problem is most of your congestion on the city system is going to be on arterials. I mean, you're really not going to have it on the collectors anyway. Uh, the volumes just aren't there. I mean, a collector can carry a lot of cars before they're really congestion you usually just don't see that level of volume on most collectors um, but I see the point about the development I'm not sure what I, how you work around it other than uh, uh, when you look at your uh, STC transportation fee you adjust accordingly and just collect more that way but yeah I mean definitely as, as a part of mitigation a lot of a lot of improvements get built as part of development mitigation for sure. Well, one of the, I mean, I'm looking at, again, at our street classifications, you know, Redland and, Red, Redland Road, or no, Holcomb and Redland, that's right. one right there by Abernathy, that's, those are both minor arterials. Right, those are arterials. Um, we just talked about Central Point, Leland, Warner Parrot, those, Beaver Creek and Warner Melling, you know, so those are intersections that um, again, I'm thinking, you know, maybe a higher standard would be okay there. If well, and there's one one um, practical um, 
scenario uh, with the uh, Walmart that you know that's uh, I've heard people say that that may cause a lot of traffic and be what Jonathan's talking about that you know we may t talk to them and see if they can put dollars uh, toward you know mitigating sure. congestion well yeah I, I realized the one point I failed to make and so here I am making it so the, the the thing about upsizing intersections for more carrying capacity for a few hours a day is, is they get bigger and that kind of works against your other modes that usually means uh, pedestrians have to cross further um, the, the vehicles you know if you've got a dedicated right turn lane and they can just go around the corner uh, they could take the corner at higher speeds which is not a good thing at an intersection um, so there, there's a downside to making development pay to make an intersection bigger for other modes that's the one point I was going to make because again you know if you're looking at 24 hours a day 8 o'clock at night it's going to be dandy you're just not going to need that right turn lane and that second left turn lane and that kind of a thing but I think you've heard that so it's a decision that needs to be made. I, you know, I, I think what the way we're going to approach it in the TSP is we're going to re recommend that change at this stage. The, the consultants are going to recommend it, and uh, I'm going to have to be directed by the commissioners that we're going to go before to, to do something different. Basically, if they don't like that approach, uh, they certainly have the option of sticking with what they got. I mean, at a minimum, I, I think I would agree. You want to go to the numerical basis as opposed to the letter grade basis because that's kind of the new that's the way we've been doing it for 10 years now we've been doing uh, the numerical version Jonathan do you have any just leaning forward I prefer volume to capacity yeah yeah okay well, let's see so we did that whoops bang uh, the last slide is just a this is just the last few steps of the process we're thinking we're going to be done in the spring we'll see how it goes um, so after the after we deliver the draft TSP uh, in November, uh, there'll be a series of work sessions at the beginning of next year, and then hearings in February and March, thinking we're going to be done or so in April. You guys, uh, have any other questions you wanted to hit on this topic? I just bring up. A <laughs> oh, there's John. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> So one of the things we talked about is providing Planning Commission City Council with our recommendation. Do we wait until that draft comes up and then we do I would. that? I would. Okay. I mean, I think I think it's going to be the way I've characterized it, but that's that's usually the way we carry these things forward. Is we have you know different positions on various aspects of the draft TSP because. Once we go to the work sessions, there could be some reshaping done at that point mm -hmm. before we actually go, is the uh, go to the hearing process. So it'd be good for you guys to weigh in on if there's any particular issues. Well, for example, I thought we had a great chance for a dialogue here tonight. And Jonathan's point about the developers and the intersections. Right. Even if you don't recommend that, you could say that's a consideration for it the is. other option. So the policymakers know that they're may feel like a forced choice, but you know, and and also talk about the fact that the money may uh, have an impact if you're trying to get metro money for metro and so on, and they don't like the standards. Right. So just so that they see, here were some pros and cons of the two, and you know, neither one is perfect. But we're you're recommending this one, and that's why. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Carl, Chair. Sure. Um, Carl, could you talk a little bit about Figure 3 in the packet? It's the planned street and intersection. The reason I think it's important to bring this diagram to your attention is because in the future, when there's, a, there's an effort to connect streets, it's very difficult, very heavy lifting that the policymakers and all involved. But by the way, do you want to come up to the so that we can get it on the recording? Thanks. I just want.
wanted to say um, that I thought perhaps we could spend a few minutes looking at figure three that shows the planned street extensions. Because when this work is done, when there are efforts made to, in fact, connect streets, there's oftentimes a lot of resistance in neighborhoods. People don't <laughs> want to change. Mm -hmm. However, there's a bigger system benefit. And um, I thought perhaps Carl could speak to that a little bit. And, and I can speak to it as well from being a state transportation planner and having studied this there is a good understanding that when you have more of a, a finer street network, it really gives opportunities to distribute the trips and, and travel choice, where people can actually get from A to B. And it enhances the ability to walk and bike. So, but it's difficult. It's one of the most difficult things to a community can do. So I just think it's important that you all see this map and so when it comes before you again in a different forum you can all say yes you know we d we were aware of this and we know it's it's difficult but uh, so and perhaps any other conversation folks want to have but that's my reasoning in uh, bringing it to your attention mm -hmm. Carl do you want to say anything further I think you cover the basics I don't know what else I would say you guys, are you, are you, first off, did you see that map in your packet? You're familiar with what it's trying to do? Uh, figure three? Yeah, we have. Figure three. Mm -hmm. There's a number of extensions shown there in the black dash yeah. lines. Mm -hmm. A couple of them, well, the one in the Beaver Creek area, that will obviously happen as, as and when Beaver Creek develops, right? Same thing in the park place. If, if that doesn't advance, then those probably won't happen anytime soon. But when they do, that'll be a piece that'll be looked for in any kind of master planning development application work will be those kinds of connections. Same thing in South End and same thing in the regional center. Uh, some of those are, are not easy connections to make and there's lots of difficulties and maybe in the end the connections won't look exactly like they're shown here, but the point is there needs to be a connection sort of like that somewhere in that vicinity of the project. And so you're trying to recognize that fact. I know there, for the area next to um, Home Depot, uh, that's an interesting area if you've been around the city for very long. That used to be a landfill, and it's not that nice of a thing to build a street on, because uh, <laughs> landfills tend to move. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the cost of that street could be a factor in terms of uh, where it is and who's going to look after it afterwards. I think the city's voiced an opinion that they'd rather make that uh, a private street but built to more city type standards so the property owner would maintain the, maintain the street because of those kinds of cost questions that I brought up. Continue. So that's the piece. I mean, we, you know, we're going to have a map like this in the TSP we're going to have development code that says as development happens on those portions of land that they need to incorporate those kinds of street pieces into their thinking. So it's just not, a, they don't come in, it's not just a blank slate. They can't do whatever they want to do. Uh, and like I said, for there, may be, there may be a discussion, a rationale for changing it compared to what it is here, but it's, that'll, that'll have to be kind of negotiated between the staff and the development. And this becomes, to a large extent, the legal framework that this is the minimum expectation and I would like to draw your attention to the regional center and ask the question is that going to be a refined enough circulation system if indeed this is the minimum is that going to satisfy um, you as citizens of Oregon City uh, if and when development occurs there if you have this street configuration is that um, your vision of a regional center just as a relatively new resident is that the one that goes through the landfill or is that the other one over by the existing uh, I think they're actually both designated within the regional center it's really that box that we're talking about on figure three right. the regional sure. center yeah. is um, does go on both sides of I two hundred five. It's both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a large. It's a large area. Mm -hmm. 
And the intention with regional centers, as I think you know, there's eight in the region, and they are the assumption is that they will be able to sustain uh, fairly dense employment as well as people living there. And the eight regional centers in the metropolitan area will be connected by high capacity transit or light rail. So there, you know, there's a lot of anticipated mm. development to occur in um, your regional center as well as around the region. So in the one on the north side of 205, it looks like it, the alignment takes it right through Fisherman's Marine there. What is it about <laughs> Fisherman's <laughs> Marine? That is a, that is a popular <laughs> spot. Mm -hmm. I've, got mm -hmm. a, I've got a real question about that too because it takes it right through the Oregon City Shopping Center. Right. Solution uh, Driving 62. And it seems like a negative message being sent to the owners of the Oregon City Shopping Center who have just invested I don't know how much money into kind of a remodel or reconfiguration of their shopping center and we're telling them our plans in the future we're going to drive a road right through the middle of your shopping center and that to me would be a negative negative message from the city I think it's fair to say the assumption is, is that the the um, existing development would not be there. It's for a future scenario. Huh. Um, and there are checks and balances in terms of how much we can expect or how much you as a, a community could ask the shopping center to do. There's, you know, the concept of takings and um, so it would really be if they were redeveloping the site uh, when this would come into play. Right. And we like, see that, you know, if you if you watch various developments, it, it um, does happen. Out on 185th out in Washington County, as an example, there was a significant shopping center there that got raised and rebuilt. Hmm. There's also the precedent <coughs> of, of a taking for economic development. Also, I think they did that in Kaiser. Took a gentleman's farm and put in a put in a mall, which is kind of a new thing. It's it's happening more and more. So I think businesses are getting a little more literary. It's not typically in the past. It's been thought of, it only happened for a public facility such as a road, but right. it takings have occurred for private investment. Um, so looking at that one again. From a layperson standpoint, the function of that alignment would be what to reduce some of the traffic that has to go on 99 to access the center. Is that it? Because it gets it off of 99. I'm just trying to figure out what that does. I believe it has less to do with 99 than providing people options as uh, for people to get from the Cove area or Main Street to the shopping center. Mm -hmm. It's just to create a finer circulation so people have travel options. Yeah, it'd be great to be able to come down 213 and then take that, the you know, the, the whoop to do road there. I mean, it'd be great <laughs> to connect through and get on you if you're heading down McLaughlin. Uh, Doesn't you do know, any whoop uh, They make a great BMX track, I think. You know, can, <laughs> yeah, that's Agnes, I think. Yes. Yeah. Is that Agnes? I think yeah. it is. Yeah. The other benefit streets have is they function as an organizing element. It gives development something to respond to or organize itself around versus um, mm -hmm. the character that exists at the shopping center today, which is um, primarily a parking lot. Right. Well, thank you. I appreciate your yeah. attention to the yeah. street connections. One of the I'm, I'm going to continue to drill down into this one because I, I, I struggled with that particular connection as well. Um, for one, we've got a cove development that's kind of still teetering out there and, you know, there's no road connection shown through that parcel for the cove development right now. And um, if that were to be approved as planned, it would, that road, that would essentially cinch 
the fact that that road would never go through. Mm-hmm. So that's one issue. Um, however, you know, despite what's on the table for the cove development, um, and and despite your concerns, Bob, about you know offending a property owner there. My sense is that property owner, they seem like they've remodeled since I've been here two, maybe tw- at least twice, where they've kind of re- redone some storefronts and trying to, you know, trying to get people in there. Um, with the right traffic pattern through that property, there would probably be a lot more value to that property, even though it goes through a, an existing store. If you uh, chose to, you know, remodel that, and that that store is tough because it's a basement as well. But it seems like there's a way to make a, uh, you know, a pro- make a roadway through that and still not lose the entire shopping center. Well, but it, but it would it would provide a lot of it would r- provide town center kind of frontage. You know what I mean? So lots of developers with that size of property would would actually love to have a street that would bring neighborhood traffic through their development because, sure. it, you know, right now they got, they're got they flying by on 99 and yeah, they can turn in there, but if there was a roadway that cut through to housing, for instance, high density housing in the Cove area, again, that's kind of a win-win. My, but my struggle with this has been we've, we, and I, I still, I know this line has has been on the plan at some point in time, but Agnes, you know, for this really to be effective, there needs to be that connection along Agnes to 213, and and ODOT struggled with approving that because of the interchange there at 213 and their concern about capacity, right? Mm -hmm. But if you connected from basically Main Street Extension and connected this through to Agnes, I mean through to 213, um, it really makes it attractive for that property owner. You know, all of a sudden then there's potential for through traffic that might have originally kind of gone around and maybe completely avoided that area to come through there. Um, so, but but we haven't we haven't been able to bridge that with ODOT, and um, and I think they've got good reasons for that, right? I, but it seems to me like if we're going to show that kind of a line, we should probably show the other line as well. That connects it to 213. The fact of the matter is that there are no plans to reconstruct the I-205-213 interchange. But if and when there are in the future, the city should advocate for a connection to Agnes and just to have what we're talking about, more travel options, more connectivity to uh, benefit the people using the regional center or trying to get to it. And I'll, I'll add, and you sort of alluded to it, John, this um, concept of a street through the Oregon City Shopping Center is not a new one. You have um, the city adopted what's called the McLaughlin Enhancement Plan that calls for this as well. Okay. And it's possible that it might be actually shown in the existing TSP. Yeah, I don't remember either. You might be you probably right. The other thing I like about this map is, uh, you know, the Beaver Creek concept plan and the Park Place concept plan, these lines are consistent with those plans. Um, The other thing that I want to point out is, you know, Holly Lane, for the most part, is outside the city and outside of our urban growth boundary, but yet we're still suggesting that we do planned street upgrades, and my hope is the county's plan does the same thing because that's, that's an important connection for future development of the Beaver Creek or Park Place area. Mm-hmm. And then out in South End, we've yet to complete that concept plan, but the idea would be to complete that concept plan. So some of these, those lines I have a little less confidence in than those that we've, where we've already completed a concept plan. But, so I like this map. I just, you know, it's, it's very, you know, conceptual. <laughs> There's lots of variability that would go into those black dotted lines. Very good. Uh, any other questions? Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, we're we're done. <coughs> thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to say it's been a pleasure.